Seventh Turning Point Before I finish, I will describe the collective lessons that I learned from each of the seven turning points of my life. But first let me describe the seventh and last of these turning points. To do so, I must go back to that eventful day, November 11, 1918. That was Armistice Day, as everyone knows. The war had left me without a penny, as I have already stated. But I was happy to know that the slaughter had ceased and reason was about to reclaim civilization once more. As I stood in front of my office window and looked out at the howling mob that was celebrating the end of the war, my mind went back into my yesterdays, especially to that eventful day when that kind old gentleman laid his hand on my shoulder and told me that if I would acquire an education I could make my mark on the world. I had been acquiring that education without knowing it. Over a period of more than twenty years I had been going to school in the University of Hard Knocks, as you must have observed from my description of the various turning points of my life. As I stood in front of that window, my entire past, with its bitter and its sweet, its ups and its downs, passed before me in review. The time had come for another turning point. I sat down to my typewriter and, to my astonishment, my hands began to play a regular tune upon the keyboard. I had never written so rapidly or so easily before. I did not plan or think about that which I was writing. I just wrote that which came into my mind. Unconsciously, I was laying the foundation for the most important turning point of my life, for when I had finished, I had prepared a document through which I financed a national magazine that gave me contact with people throughout the English-speaking world. So greatly did that document influence my own career and the lives of tens of thousands of other people that I believe it will be of interest to the students of this course. Therefore, I am reproducing it, just as it appeared in Hill's Golden Rule magazine, where it was first published as follows. A Personal Visit with Your Editor I am writing on Monday, November 11th, 1918. Today will go down in history as the greatest holiday. On the street, just outside of my office window, the surging crowds of people are celebrating the downfall of an influence that has menaced civilization for the past four years. The war is over. Soon our boys will be coming back home from the battlefields of France. The lord and master of brute force is nothing but a shadowy ghost of the past. Two thousand years ago the Son of Man was an outcast, with no place of abode. Now the situation has been reversed, and the devil has no place to lay his head. Let each of us take unto himself the great lesson that this world war has taught, namely, only that which is based upon justice and mercy toward all, the weak and the strong, the rich and the poor alike, can survive. All else must pass on. Out of this war will come a new idealism, an idealism that will be based upon the golden rule philosophy, an idealism that will guide us not to see how much we can do our fellow man for, but how much we can do for him that will ameliorate his hardships and make him happier as he tarries by the wayside of life. Emerson embodied this idealism in his great essay, The Law of Compensation. Another great philosopher embodied it in these words, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The time for practicing the golden rule philosophy is upon us. In business as well as in social relationships, he who neglects or refuses to use this philosophy as the basis of his dealings will but hasten the time of his failure. And, while I am intoxicated with the glorious news of the war's ending, is it not fitting that I should attempt to do something to help preserve for the generations yet to come one of the great lessons to be learned from William Hohenzollern's effort to rule the earth by force? I can best do this by going back twenty-two years from my beginning. Come with me, won't you? It was a bleak November morning, probably not far from the eleventh of the month, that I got my first job as a laborer in the coal mine regions of Virginia at wages of a dollar a day. A dollar a day was a big sum in those days, especially to a boy of my age. Of this, I paid fifty cents a day for my board and room. Shortly after I began work, the miners became dissatisfied and commenced talking about striking. I listened eagerly to all that was said. I was especially interested in the organizer who had organized the union. He was one of the smoothest speakers I had ever heard, 
and his words fascinated me. He said one thing in particular that I have never forgotten, and if I knew where to find him I would look him up today and thank him warmly for saying it. The philosophy which I gathered from his words has had a most profound and enduring influence upon me. Perhaps you will say that most labor agitators are not very sound philosophers, and I would agree with you if you said so. Maybe this one was not a sound philosopher, but surely the philosophy he expounded on this occasion was sound. Standing on a dry goods box, in the corner of an old shop where he was holding a meeting, he said, Men, we are talking about striking. Before you vote, I wish to call your attention to something that will benefit you if you will heed what I say. You want more money for your work, and I wish to see you get it, because I believe you deserve it. May I not tell you how to get more money and still retain the good will of the owner of this mine? We can call a strike and probably force them to pay more money, but we cannot force them to do this and like it. Before we call a strike, let us be fair with the owner of the mine and with ourselves. Let us go to the owner and ask him if he will divide the profits of his mine with us fairly. If he says yes, as he probably will, then let us ask him how much he made last month, and if he will divide among us a fair proportion of any additional profits he may make if we all jump in and help him earn more next month. He, being human, like each of us, will no doubt say, Why, certainly, boys, go to it and I'll divide with you. It is but natural that he would say that, boys. After he agrees to the plan, as I believe he will, if we make him see that we are in earnest, I want every one of you to come to work with a smile on your face for the next thirty days. I want to hear you whistling a tune as you go into the mines. I want you to go at your work with the feeling that you are one of the partners in this business. Without hurting yourself, you can do almost twice as much work as you are doing. And if you do more work, you are sure to help the owner of this mine make more money. And if he makes more money, he will be glad to divide a part of it with you. He will do this for sound business reasons, if not out of a spirit of fair play. He will retaliate as surely as there is a God above us. If he doesn't, I'll be personally responsible to you, and if you say so, I'll help blow this mine into smithereens. That's how much I think of the plan, boys. Are you with me? They were to the man. Those words sank into my heart as though they had been burned there with a the red-hot iron. The following month, every man in the mines received a bonus of 20% of his month's earnings. Every month thereafter, each man received a bright red envelope with his part of the extra earnings in it. On the outside of the envelope were these printed words, Your part of the profits from the work which you did that you were not paid to do. I have gone through some pretty tough experiences since those days of twenty-odd years ago, but I have always come out on top. A little wiser, a little happier, and a little better prepared to be of service to my fellow men, owing to my having applied the principle of performing more work than I was actually paid to perform. It may be of interest to you to know that the last position I held in the coal business was that of assistant to the chief counsel for one of the largest companies in the world. It is a considerable jump from the position of common laborer in the coal mines to that of assistant to the chief counsel of one of the largest companies a jump that I never could have made without the aid of this principle of performing more work than I was paid to perform. I wish I had the space in which to tell you of the scores of times that this idea of performing more work than I was paid to perform has helped me over rough spots. Many have been the times that I have placed an employer so deeply in my debt through the aid of this principle that I got whatever I asked for without hesitation or quibbling, without complaint or hard feelings, and, what is more important, without the feeling that I was taking unfair advantage of my employer. I believe most earnestly that anything a man acquires from his fellow man without the full consent of the one from whom it is acquired will eventually burn a hole in his pocket or blister the palms of his hands to say nothing of gnawing at his conscience until his heart aches with regret. As I said in the beginning, I am writing on the morning of the 11th of November while the crowds are celebrating the great victory of right over wrong. Therefore, it is but natural that I should turn to the silence of my heart for some thought to pass on to the world today, some thought that will help keep alive in the minds of Americans the spirit of idealism for which they have fought and in which they entered the world war. I find nothing more appropriate than the philosophy which I have related, 
because I earnestly believe it was the arrogant disregard of this philosophy that brought Germany, the Kaiser and his people, to grief. To get this philosophy into the hearts of those who need it, I shall publish a magazine to be called Hill's Golden Rule. It takes money to publish national magazines, and I haven't very much of it at this writing, but before another month shall have passed, through the aid of the philosophy that I have tried to emphasize here, I shall find someone who will supply the necessary money and make it possible for me to pass on to the world the simple philosophy that lifted me out of the dirty coal mines and gave me a place where I can be of service to humanity. The philosophy which will raise you, my dear reader, whoever you may be and whatever you may be doing, into whatever position in life you may make up your mind to attain. Every person has, or ought to have, the inherent desire to own something of monetary value. In at least a vague sort of way, every person who works for others, and this includes practically all of us, looks forward to the time when he will have some sort of a business or a profession of his own. The best way to realize that ambition is to perform more work than one is paid to perform. You can get along with but little schooling. You can get along with but little capital. You can overcome almost any obstacle with which you are confronted if you are honestly and earnestly willing to do the best work of which you are capable, regardless of the amount of money you receive for it. Note. It is the afternoon of November the 21st, just ten days since I wrote the foregoing editorial. I have just read it to George B. Williams of Chicago, a man who came up from the bottom through the aid of the philosophy of which I have written, and he has made the publication of Hill's Golden Rule magazine possible. It was in this somewhat dramatic manner that a desire which had lain dormant in my mind for nearly twenty years became translated into reality. During all that time I had wanted to become the editor of a newspaper. Back more than thirty years ago, when I was a very small boy, I used to kick the press for my father when he was publishing a small weekly newspaper, and I grew to love the smell of printer's ink. Perhaps this desire was subconsciously gaining momentum all those years of preparation, while I was going through the experiences outlined in the turning points of my life, until it had finally to burst forth in terms of action. Or it may be that there was another plan, over which I had no control, that urged me on and on, never giving me any rest in any other line of work, until I began the publication of my first magazine. That point can be passed for the moment. The important thing to which I would direct your attention is the fact that I found my proper niche in the world's work and I was very happy over it. Strangely enough, I entered upon this work with never a thought of looking for either the end of the rainbow or the proverbial pot of gold which is supposed to be found at its end. For the first time in my life I seemed to realize, beyond room for doubt, that there was something else to be sought in life that was worth more than gold. Therefore I went at my editorial work with but one main thought in mind, and I pause while you ponder over this thought. And that thought was to render the world the best service of which I was capable, whether my efforts brought me a penny in return or not.